So welcome, and good morning uh, to this talk about Apache Olingo. Um, I'm Stefan Glevens. Uh, I'm working for SAP and I'm the vice president of Apache Olingo. Um, Apache Olingo did enter the incubator at Apache in August last year and the project did graduated has graduated recently and is now a top level project. Uh, something I have to show to you. Here we have the press release. It's from Monday. Yeah. So the foundation has announced that Olingo has to, is to be a top level project now. So we were very proud of that. So this talk is about Olingo. And Olingo is the implementation of the OData protocol. So I will give you first a brief overview about what OData is. So uh, look inside the features of OData and the definition of it. Uh, OData is in the meantime an OASIS standard. And that standard was also uh, released recently. So it does not exist for a longer time. OData itself exists longer, but I give you an update about the history of well, that uh, in a few minutes. So that's the first part of my talk here, so that you can overview what OData is. And in the second part, I just want to do some demos, first of all, to play a little bit with OData. So I will show to you what you can do with OData. And I will also do some demos with our so-called processor implementations. So this is what you get with Olingo. And uh, here I can show what you can do with Olingo uh, and OData protocol. So that's the first part of it, about OData. So OData stands for Open Data Protocol. And in the meantime, that's an OASIS standard. We have a website, odata.org, where you can find all the information about OData, the documentation and also the different uh, uh, versions of OData, information about that. And you will also find links to the ecosystem are around OData, like uh, consumers and producers of OData. OData itself is based on REST principles. So it's a web protocol. And it supports JSON and AtomPub data formats. And there are also various implementations available in .NET, Java, JavaScript, Ruby, PHP, and also Objective-C. And maybe there are more coming in future. So what is the reason for having our data? So well, there isn't, is first of all, a problem. The problem is that there is data everywhere in the world. And usually, this data is locked into silos. So what does that mean, actually? On that picture on the right side, you can see that there are relational databases, there are file systems, there are XML information which exists in XML files, uh, there are no SQL databases, and much more. All of these uh, data stores do have usually have proprietary API how you can access the data. So for relational database, you will use SQL. Uh, if the data is stored in file systems, you have a standard API to access them. If you use XML, you will have a parser. Uh, or if you use a NoSQL database, then you have a query API usually. The problem is if you want to consume all of this data, you have to have knowledge about all of these different access points. And the goal of our data is, to, first of all, to have an abstraction on that. So all of these data stores can be exposed via the OData protocol. And the main point is that this protocol works over the internet. So if you look on the standard uh, binary APIs, uh, it doesn't work over the internet. So ODBC or JDBC, that does not work over the internet. And the internet is HTTP. Yeah. So the basic idea is to uh, make the data accessible over HTTP and put something like the idea behind SQL or SQL uh, into that protocol so that you can query data using 
HTTP and get access to all the data that exists already. So OData will open the, the data silos. So uh, one goal is of OData is it should be seen as the SQL, the SQL for the web. Sure. But some, somehow related, yeah. Yeah, I just want to try to understand. Do you, do you have any, any way to clarify like, what the distinctions are between those two? Or? Uh, no, I can't. can't uh, I, I don't know uh, the semantic data network in, uh, in detail, so I cannot uh, talk about that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah. But I know it's somehow related, so OData is just a concrete realization for a protocol. Yeah. So. Um, this is just a scenario which is addressed. You can see here on the left side the client side, the server side. On the server side, we have different technologies like .NET, Java, Ruby, PHP, and so on. And there are also uh, implementations available like Azure, MySQL, uh, the App Engine, uh, SAP uh, provides a lot of data, IBM, and also Oracle databases. So these are the producers of data. On the client side, you have also a technology stack like .NET, iOS, JavaScript, Java, Ruby, and so on. You have the different devices like Android devices, iPads, and of course also uh, desktop PCs. On the application side, there are Excel, Tableau, Linkpad, PowerShell, or Data Explorer. So these are the consumers of a data. And uh, this is now collected via the internet. And that means you have the REST principles, you have the HTTP protocol, you have get, put, post, delete commands, and you have the formats like Atom and JSON. If you look on the history, where is uh, our data coming from? It did start a few years ago internally as an internal pro Microsoft project was called Project Astoria. I don't know much about that. I only know that name. So that was the beginning of that initiative. That was then uh, embedded into a product of Microsoft in the ADO.NET data services, which became then later the WCF data services. So at that point, it was just something proprietary owned by Microsoft. And then something happened. So Microsoft did open that standard and put it under Microsoft Open Specification Promise. And from that point on, it was usable and accessible for all. So that was the first step to get it somehow open. And so it became, at that time, uh, they released it as version 2 or data 2. And uh, there were immediately initiatives on top of that standard, so like, for instance, Olingo. We did start a little bit later on, but we have taken the version 2 standard uh, to start with our project here. So and there were also a lot of other open source initiatives. You find a lot of library implementations on Google Code, also on GitHub and uh, uh, for, um, open source platforms like that. The next step was then Microsoft Open Specification Promise. It was open, but it was still owned by Microsoft, and that maybe for some companies a no-go. And so uh, Microsoft was willing to give that standard to Oasis. And that was the time point when it became very interesting. And you can see here on the uh, uh, upper right corner, a lot of companies now working or looking into that standard and also actively contributing to that Oasis standard. There was a release of data 3.0. It was uh, released to the public by Microsoft. That was just intermediate release because of uh, that closed Microsoft Open Specification Promise of data 2 release was not accepted by Oasis because of it was owned by Microsoft. So they just make the public release and put that into um, the Oasis committee. Uh, there are some implementations available who implemented also the OData 3.0 standard, but uh, that's just in the immediate release. And the major goal was to come up with OData 4.0, and this is the first release coming out of OASIS TC, Technical Committee. And that was announced a few weeks ago, so that's also available right now. 
And here you can see that a lot of companies are working on that uh, protocol standard like Microsoft, SAP, WSO, Citrix, Progress, IBM, and, and also a lot of uh, much more of, uh, which are not mentioned here. Um, if you look a little bit deeper into what OData actually is, so this diagram here just gives a raw structure of the protocol. The key point is that the architecture of the whole protocol is REST. So it does uh, follow the REST principles. That means it's stateless, it makes use of the HTTP protocol, is using the HTTP methods, get, put, post. Uh, um, it will build, uh, it, it's, um, um, the data is not seen as data anymore like you uh, see it in a database as tables, rows, and properties instead of data are resources. So that's also a key point uh, with the REST principle. Um, so the protocol is HTTP. Uh, as I mentioned already, get, put, post, delete, uh, that the data is seen as a resource. And quite important is that the protocol makes also use here of HTTP uh, um, features like cache and proxies. That's quite important uh, to get also scalable and performance services on top of our data. The data formats are AtomPub and JSON. And uh, a key point is also that OData comes with metadata. That's derived from CSDL, the Conceptual Data Definition Language. Uh, that's a standard by Microsoft uh, from the WCS uh, Web Services. Um, that's just a def uh, definition how you can describe metadata. And uh, so that's very close uh, to uh, Shen's entity data, data model. So uh, in Shen's model, you have entities and associations. In OData, we have resources and links. And uh, you can perform uh, create, read, update, delete operations on data. So read resource, create resources, change resources, also delete resources. So that's the basic structure of the protocol, what you can do with that. If you look a little bit deeper into what the entity data model is, so these are the metadata, you can see that you can, first of all, define an entity container. The entity container can con contains multiple entity sets. These are collections of uh, data sets. So uh, a data set is like a feed, and uh, the entity set can have an entity, multiple entities, so a list of entities. And each entity can have properties and some special kind of property, which is navigation property. Not mentioned here is that you can also have uh, complex properties and stuff like that. So there are much more details around. Uh, the navigation properties are used for associations, so they can link to other entity sets uh, or also entities. So that's the difference between uh, one to one relations and one to many relations. So if you have a relation to an entity, it's a one to one relation. If you have an association to an entity set, then it's a one to n relation. And uh, this uh, data model is described in a metadata document. I have a snapshot here. So you can query for the metadata using the protocol, and then you get uh, this schema here. So first of all, you can define entity types, like here an employee. You can define the key properties, and all the properties contained uh, belong, belong to that uh, uh, entity. Uh, they have, can have multiple types, so EDM string, integer, long, date, time, stuff like that. All of that is defined in no data. Yes, please. Yeah, because of it's uh, based on uh, the, it's based no, it's not based uh, on data 2.0, two it's uh, the CSDL right. uh, oh. sp specification that defines the metadata that's just used here. So OData, this is something I have to say, OData builds on other standards. It builds on HTTP, it builds also on the AtomPub format, and it uses also CSDL. It's not CSDL one-to-one, -one, it's just a subset of CSDL. 
I think so, yes. So it can be used publicly. Um, I'm act honestly, I have to say, this is Odata version 2. And I'm currently not sure if Odata 4, the Oasis standard, has made its own CSDL definition. Uh, this is something which uh, but I do not know because of uh, Odata 4 is not released completely. So currently, they release it only part by part. So they have released uh, the, the JSON document format, the protocol standard, and stuff like that. Maybe there's something changing in the future. OK, here you can also see that you can define navigation properties uh, between entities or uh, entity sets and all that details. And as you can see with the syndication uh, uh, attributes here, that you can also link properties to uh, the atom pub feed standard. So if you look a little bit more deeper into that uh, entity data model, you can see here the different types that you have. So you have collection entries properties of an entry, the complex type, link, and also service operation. So a collection, that's an entity set. And the navigation property of an entity type that identifies a collection of entities. So um, that's what I said already with uh, having uh, associations with one-to-one -one or one-to-many. The entry, that's a single entity, which has an entity type that defines its properties. Um, there's also inheritance in the EDM, so types can derive from other types so that you can uh, reuse them. Um, properties of an entry, there are two types, primitive types, which are just uh, Boolean, integer, uh, string, whatever. And you can also have uh, complex entity types uh, where you combine multiple properties to be one type. So that's the complex type. When you have the link, these are just defined as navigation properties in the entity type. And something special are the service operation, the function import. Um, this is something uh, where you can trigger uh, operations on a server from a client side. So that was about the entity data model. If you have now a look on the concrete uh, data that we get back from the service. The first thing what we have is the service document. So usually you have one endpoint to our data service. And this is just the entry point to the whole data model. That means you get a service document. And this service document lists all of the collections that are contained in that service, which are accessible. And it makes uh, use of the HTRS uh, principle, that's uh, REST principle, stands for hypertext as the engine of application state. Uh, that means that all information uh, which, you, which is required to work with the service is contained in a document. Yeah? That means if you look on that document, you have here on the, on the top a base URL, which uh, defines the service route. And you have here the collections, which are just hrefs. So you can take the href of a manager, just add it to the base root, and then you will get the entity set of the managers or the buildings and so on. So you can use the document to navigate into the service and do an exploration on that. And very important part of our data are the URI. URI conventions. So usually uh, there are two important parts. A part of that we have a service root URI. <coughs> There's a resource path, and there are query options. So the root just does identify the service, and it's the endpoint where you can reach the service. Then you have the resource path. The resource path identifies the entities or the entity sets within the service. And you can navigate with the resource path down from entity set to an entity, to a property, to a complex property, 
to the value of the property. Uh, so here you can build very complex path, paths, and you can also make use of uh, navigation properties. That means if you have one, ent uh, one entity, you can use, use a navigation property to navigate to another entity. Uh, so this is how you can resolve uh, associations between entities. You have query options, so there's a various set of uh, query options that you can add to the URI, like the filter operation, where you can do a filtering on an entity set. You have uh, a select options, so if you don't want to read all the properties of an entity, then you can just specify a select option, where you just select the properties you want to read. And so you can, for instance, then uh, specify slash products as an entity set, so it will deliver you all products as a feed. You can address a single entity uh, while you put the ID of a specific entity uh, to the entity set URL. Then you have member access, where you can access a single property like the price, or you can do a link traversal when you select a navigation property. So if you look here on that syntax diagram, you can see what you can do with a URI. So you have these two parts, the resource path and also the query options. Uh, on the resource path, first of all, you have a collection, which is an entity set. Then you can optionally specify a key predicate, or you can add another path segment, which is dollar count at the end, when you get the number of the entities, which is contained in the entity set, so this is a kind of query. Um, with, if you have a key predicate, then it's not a collection anymore, when it's an, enti an entity, a concrete uh, um, um, instance. And here you can uh, specify navigation properties, or you can uh, specify a complex type, a property, or the value of the property at the end. So this is a very flexible uh, schema or syntax, how you can construct URLs and you can uh, address all your data. And all of that is based on REST principle. So even if you have a count which just, just returns a number, it's a resource. Yeah. Uh, if you specify a key predicate, then you have one hand side, you can just specify a key value if it's just a single key. Or you can also list properties if you have a complex key. Yeah. And the part below, uh, this is just a syntax diagram, how you can navigate uh, with, uh, with uh, navigation properties or how you can make use of links uh, to other entities. And the last part here is about the service operation. These are the function imports, which you can uh, call on the server. So there's some kind of mapping between uh, EDM and At AtomPub. So uh, I mentioned already on EDM, you have entity containers, entity set, entity and property, and that maps one-to-one -to, -one to Atom AtomPub. So uh, the entity container that's equal with the server, the entity set is a collection of feed, uh, the entity is an entry, and the property is a property. Then uh, here just an uh, example for an uh, atom entry. And also here you can see how that makes use of the HTRS uh, principle. So there are links included, which you can use to edit an entry. Uh, how to access the value of uh, an entry, uh, where you get also the navigation, uh, the navigation links. And here on, on the, in the property section, you have all the data that belongs to that entry. Uh, another point is if you have a uh, feed, which could contain multiple entries, and you can think about that sometimes if you have a large data set, that you don't want to have all the uh, entries uh, returned in one call. For instance, if you have several thousand entries, then OData has also included uh, a paging mechanism. That means, first of all, you can restrict the size of entries returned server side. That means the server can limit uh, the result set, let's say, to 100 entries. 
And at the end of the feed, you will get the so-called next link. So it will return the first 100 entries. And then you can make use of the next link to get the next 100 entries. Um, so this is the, these are the basics, uh, what OData is. Uh, this is just an overview about the OData 4 standard. So what's the difference between the OASIS OData 4 standard and the versions that uh, uh, did exist before. So what, what I, I, uh, um, I talked about OData, it was more or less generic. It's valid for OData 2, 3, and also 4. And here are the design goals of OData 4. So here there are some uh, very interesting additions on top of OData, uh, like uh, it can be used to build a web of structured data. That means you can have multiple services, and also these services can have associations and links between. Um, so a basic design goal is also to define uh, a UL schema where you can define a query to reduce uh, the round trips that are required to make to the server. Yeah. So do only few round trips to the server so that you do not overload uh, the server on one hand side and also get problems with latency and stuff like that. Then uh, the query language uh, should be simple and intuitive. And uh, this is something I will show to you uh, later on when we do the demos, how that works. Uh, all features of OData should be combinable to each other. So for instance, if you uh, have a navigation path where you navigate from an entity set over a navigation property to another entry, you can use all the query options which then work on the result that you get at the end of the URL path. Um, or if you have something like a filter, you can combine it with a select. Yeah, you select only, uh, you, you, you filter only for specific uh, entries. And when do you, you can do a select uh, for all the entries that they only return specific properties. Um, each single feature should be as simple as possible. And it's also a design goal that there's only one way to achieve uh, the same goal. Then it also includes model evol evolution. So there's a versioning concept included in OData. So uh, this is something I learned in one of the talks yesterday, that it's always a good idea to uh, put a version schema to a REST service. You can do that by URL, or you can do that by an uh, HTTP header. Here in OData, it's an HTTP header, which is used for a versioning, uh, versioning schema. Uh, there's a model reuse and a cross-service navigation. Here, yeah, that's the idea of building mashups. So you have a lot of services, and you can combine them together. Deltas is a quite important feature. So uh, one use case for our data is to be used on mobile devices. Mobile devices often disconnected from the internet. At least I have here a um, lot of problems with uh, the Wi-Fi. And that means you want to synchronize the data to your mobile device usually. And if you are connected back to the, to the uh, network, then you want to do a synchronization of the deltas. So here you have that delta support. Uh, or data for defines uh, asynchronous requests and callbacks. And vocabularies and annotations, this is something which is related to uh, the usage from a UI point of view when you build web UIs. So the uh, EDM, uh, or data defines metadata. And metadata is sometimes uh, important to render a user interface because of you get all the constraints and restriction of the data. Uh, what you also want to get is uh, how is the data named? So what are the labels for the data? And uh, here the metadata is not good enough, not sufficient, because of the metadata usually is in English. But you want to have translated labels. And here you can put uh, vocabularies and also annotations to the metadata so that you get, for instance, for an entity set, a translatable uh, a name which can be translated. Then uh, there are actions and functions. So action is something which is new. Function did all, uh, already exists for, um, 
for data two. Uh, the definition is that functions are usually side effect free. So the basic idea is was to control something on a server, uh, start a database or start an application um, um, or switch it off, uh, trigger some action on, on, on the server. Uh, the action itself, these are operations on the data so they could have side effects. There's improved query language for, which includes uh, search capabilities, cross join and also lambda operations. And there's improved type system. That means uh, you have uh, a part of the well-known primitive types which are exist in all programming languages. You have now an extended type system for geotypes, for instance. You can have entity references and there's a new JSON format. So that was one of the key findings with OData2 that the load, uh, the payload, is sometimes an issue. So that's because of OData is supporting on one hand side Atom, Atom pub, on the other hand JSON because of it's just leaner. And new JSON means also you have a possibility uh, to configure if you would read the metadata as the metadata document, that means you, get, you do one call getting a huge metadata document. Sometimes that does not work if you have really uh, many metadata. And uh, OData4 gives also the option to you to include metadata into the payload. So you have only the metadata parts that are required for uh, executing a request. And um, so you, you can decide here what kind uh, of flexibility would you like to have. Uh, problem is <coughs> if you put metadata in the payload, it will of course increase your uh, payload again. I know that the, the, the metadata is stored in a small format, right? Yes. If, if you put it in a payload, can you send email with JSON format? It is. Yeah. And there are also plans. That's, that's currently, I would say, that's a disadvantage of a data for. That metadata only uh, exists as XML. And there are plans uh, for future version also to provide a JSON format for metadata. At least uh, at Olingo, we have a big problem with supporting uh, uh, the mobile devices like Android, uh, which has not a sufficient XML support. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that was just a brief overview about what OData is the history and where it's coming from, what are features of OData are. Um, yeah? Um, so uh, where are the actual domains from? Is this, are you going against a public database or uh, a web service? Or where's the data actually coming from, the data types? Uh, this is maybe something you can uh, see when I show you the demos. Okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, that was just a protocol definition. Yeah. So theory, now we come to the practice. That means uh, how can you access the data actually? Yeah, and uh, that's also why we have the Olingo project. Uh, the Olingo project implements uh, the protocol standard. And here I can, you also, uh, I can also show to you how you can get real access to the data, to the database actually. So first of all, I would like to play with our data. Um, let's do a switch here. Uh, I don't find my mouse cursor. Is that, is that your car? Uh, that's a slot car. <laughs> that's, a, that's a slot car of my son. <laughs> act, act, actually, it is, it is my car, yeah. And my son is not allowed to play with that. <laughs> So, okay. So, here I'm having an no data service that was built with uh, Olingo, and we can just a little bit play around with what you what you can do with OData. So, for instance, if you click on the service document, so here you can see. This is the endpoint of the service, and here you can how you can reach a service document. And you can see that uh, this uh, service document, this service has now uh, three collections. 
So three NDT sets, cars, drivers, and manufacturers. So uh, I can take now the car uh, href and just add it here uh, to the service document. And that will leave me then to uh, um, and feed, which just returns all the cars which are here in the, in the database. Uh, I can specify a query option here, like um, format dollar format equals JSON when the feed is returned as a, a JSON document. And here you can see that it also includes some metadata and all the uh, property information of, of uh, the entries. Uh, I can. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's the main task. Um, all, all Lingo has two main tasks. The first thing is analyze the URL. So we have an URL parser, which is parsing the URL. URL is like a programming language. Uh, it can be very complex, very long. And if you, for instance, specify filter, uh, filter operations, uh, when you get a past uh, UI object, that's one thing. You can, as an application or service provider, a consume, uh, producer, you can take that URL information to find out what kind of query do I have to do to my database. I do the query, read the data, put it into a data structure, and give it back to Olinko to render the response. And we are rendering it as JSON or as XML. So if you look on the metadata document, you can see here that's just a resource. Uh, you can see uh, the entity type and all the properties and also what the, the key property here is. So we have here an entity type for car, for the driver, and the manufacturer. And there's also a complex property for the address. And there are some associations defined between car and drivers, car and manufacturer. And there's a default container that defines all the entity sets based on the entity types. I will show to you. Okay. We go into the code. Yeah, so first, I just want to show how uh, it looks from a client point, uh, point of perspective. Um, so we can here we had already a look here on, on a feed, which returns all the cars or also the manufacturers. I said also that it's optimized to minimize the round trips yeah, that you have to do to the server to query for data. So here this is a very uh, nice feature to expand. If you have a feed that returns the manufacturers, and each manufacturer has an association to the cars he builds then you can do an expand, and that means the feed returns not just the manufacturers, but also the cars that are built by that manufacturer. So click on that. As you can see here, well, it ma makes no sense to look all on the single lines, what is the long feed, yeah? because of it contains all the manufacturers and all the cars. Yeah? And that's because of we expand the navigation properties of cars which is contained in, in the manufacturer's uh, entity type. If you, I remove that, you can see here that we have only two manufacturers, and they build many cars. Yeah. So you have one round trip to get all the data. Um, that's, by the way, also, uh, that works also for the write operation. If you do a post or put, uh, you have often a problem uh, if you do it just on single entries, uh, who exists first. Yeah? Uh, from a database point of view, they have to be created at the same time. Yeah? Um, so that's the, that's the expand. Uh, we can also do an order by, so we can uh, uh, query for the drivers and do a, an uh, order by. Uh, query option here by the last name. So they are just sorted by the last name of the drivers. So that's a sorted feed. Um, or we can do uh, a query, like here, that filter. So return 
all drivers that which have a, uh, a birthday greater than 1981. So we have only one. Um, so these are the entity sets. When I extend uh, the, the navigation, uh, the, the resource path by adding the, uh, the, the key literals uh, to the end of the entity sets, when I'm addressing a single entity, so for instance, if I want to read one manufacturer with the ID one, I have an URL like this, and now I'm get back an entry, not, it's not a feed anymore. So that's just a single entry. Um, here you can see, um, yeah, I can also do the expand on a, on a single entry. So I have here uh, uh, one car, and this is in line with the manufacturer that has built the car. Yes? Uh, that was the, the reuse of existing standards so that you can use feed clients uh, to access the data. That was just uh, one idea of that. Uh, when I do, I can do, you have just to add another query option. And you get the same data. As an uh, as an JSON document, and uh, it contains also well here you have uh, the the car data, and here as an include the manufacturer that has built that car. Okay, and uh, you can drill down. So we have here uh, the entity sets, the entities. And we can do the drill down also to the property. So I can access here a single property. So I have driver with ID one and just want to read the last name. Pardon? If, if uh, no, this is just, uh, just the access to a single property. If you have uh, um, multiple values, first of all, you know, data 2, this is not supported, and it's a, but it's a feature for data 4 when you get a comma separated list of values. Yeah. And you can also access, so, so you get um, um, the last name as an XML document, and you can also directly access the value directly. And you get just back the name directly, the value here of the property. Yes. Uh, oh. So here we have a complex type like the address. Here you get a complex type. Okay, that's uh, how um, uh, how our data works in practice. All of this uh, this service was built with Olingo, and now I come to the code. And uh, well. We have uh, different layers of abstraction. So you can build a service handcrafted, let's say. That means everything's in under, under your control. Uh, in that case, you have to implement a provider. And we have an API how you can build your metadata. And uh, that's, that's a hard task to do because of metadata can be very complex. But you have all the freedom which you maybe want. So for instance, if you have uh, dynamic metadata, uh, you can build it out of API. So here you can make calls to your database to query for your metadata, and you can build a metadata document by using our API. That's the, the hard way. And the same is, the second thing what you have to do is you have to implement a data processor. So that's, the provider is responsible to uh, deliver the metadata, and the processor is responsible to query for the data and update the data. And uh, here you have also to uh, serve our interface to read an entity set. 
And here you get an URI info object, which contains the past information from the URL you've typed in. And then it's, of course, also a hard task to implement this, because of you have to analyze all the details you get from the UI, and then do a query. And at the end, uh, you have to fill a data object here. And then you have, so you get back the cars. This is very uh, in, uh, lean in memory implementation, not a real database. And then you just write a feed where you add the cars uh, using the metadata and also adding the content type, so JSON or XML feed or whatever. Yeah. So this is hand, a handcrafted service. So uh, it's very complex to implement such kind of service, but you have all the free freedom uh, you maybe want, so there are no restrictions on that. Uh, we have a different, a part of that you just need to implement the service factory, so that's just the entry point into the service. So you have actually three classes a provider, a processor, a factory, that's it. And here we have just uh, a data store, which is just in memory. Um, we have some extensions, for instance, which this is much simpler. This is uh, based on annotations, so you can define Java beans. And you here you can just add uh, annotations uh, to the beans to get your metadata. Uh, so uh, address became automatically uh, entity set for addresses, or in this case, I think it's a complex type. Have a look here on the car. So this is an entity type, an entity set. You can also uh, have mappings, name mappings, and you have key properties and single uh, uh, primitive properties, and also navigation properties are somewhere included, not in the car, but in the driver. I think... Uh, yeah, nav navigation properties are just uh, properties uh, to other entities. Uh, so that's a simple task if it compared to uh, implement your own provider. And uh, when you have just a service factory, you have just to implement a service factory where you just make uh, this uh, uh, beans uh, uh, known to the service. That's all. So that's a very simple way how you get a service. And this implementation is uh, the, the idea behind that is that you can mock a service. Yeah. So there's no real database behind that because of we have only uh, in memory uh, hash table behind that. And the third option, what we have is you can do the same also with a JPA uh, database or with a JPA application. Here you can define your JPA uh, entities, so address. This is, this is a, a, a trust JPA annotations. And uh, Olingo understand JPA annotations and build out of metadata out of that. And uh, so you have here uh, the an uh, this annotated classes which belong to JPA. And then you only need uh, also a factory uh, to bring Olingo together with that uh, JPA uh, persistency. And in this case, uh, Olingo does work also out of the box. So you have not much effort to expose your data via JPA as a no data service. Drawback is in JPA, we have not implemented all features. So if you find out that something is missing, just give us a hint on the mailing list. And um, so you have several options how you can uh, make use of your data service. I'm not familiar with JPA, what's the uh, The Java Persistence API. Yeah. So that's all uh, what I want to show to you. So if you have to do something with your data, I would recommend have a look into Olingo. It can save a lot of work for you because of you have implemented a lot to uh, serve the protocol. Current state is that we have a release for our data too. And actually, the community is uh, working on, uh, on OData 4 implementation. This is uh, unfortunately not released yet. But I hope. Just how much of a amount of work you get from query parameters? <laughs> yeah, so as I said, uh, if you have uh, query parameters, for instance, to build a filter, um, we have a parser that builds an abstract syntax tree out, 
tree out of that filter, and then you can traverse that, uh, that syntax tree by using the visitor pattern to do a translation from the URL syntax into, for instance, a, JPA, a J JQL uh, or SQL query statement. It's, if you have a case like this, then you have to do maybe the manual effort implementing your own service. Because of here, we have, of course, a, a generic implementation for J that works for JPA. Mm -hmm. yeah. So our goal is to, impl to provide generic implementations uh, as much as possible, but we know generic sometimes has uh, bad taste because of it's not optimized for a specific use case, and uh, you can overwrite all the methods to have your own implementation for that. Yeah, when you have to do uh, implementation from scratch, so that's a basic implementation where you have to implement your own processor. Here you can access your data using the API, which is required to access your data. Okay, so there, there are no standard connectors. Yeah, we don't have that yet. That's maybe that's what. Uh, it's an option for us. So we say Olingo, uh, first of all, serves the data standard, so the protocol, but it has also ex extensions on top. Currently, we have the annotation support, where you can mock a service, and we have the JPA support. So, yes, it is a servlet. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a basic, basic servlet. Yeah. Okay. So I think... Uh, we are more or less done. So thanks a lot for attending. I hope it was interesting for you.